Donnie and Dolly. The team is supported by ableauctions.ca. Closing your business, we can help. Tuesday, and all of our guests, including Craig Button, standing by, brought to you by the Bayside Oceanfront Resort. Book your stay at the Bayside and enjoy the many amenities the hotel has to offer, such as oceanfront rooms, free parking, oceanfront restaurant, cafe, indoor and outdoor swimming pools, gym, and more. Call 250-248-8333. Go to their website, BaysideResortParksville.com. As we bring in... Craig Button, TSN uh, Scouting Director, Flames and Canucks tonight at Rogers Arena. Craig, thanks for doing this. How are you, sir? I am great. I really am great. A little bit of snow in Calgary. I'm in oh. Toronto, but my wife, my wife, let me know that we got some snow. So, oh well, I'm not yeah. there, so I don't really have to concern myself yeah. with it. Uh, same thing uh, in Edmonton. This, this just in. <laughs> we live in Canada. Yes. Yeah. And although it's, it, it is, it is nice here. Hey, uh, uh, Craig, your, your old team, the Calgary Flames, uh, in town. How do you explain Andre Kuzmenko's statistically, at least? How do you explain his success with the Flames so far? Uh, certainly recently, 16 points in nine games. Well, what I would say is, I mean, you, you watched Andre last year with yeah. the Vancouver Canucks. I mean, he was a really good offensive player. And certainly, you know, Rick Tockett, you know, was working to to develop the team in different areas of the game. You know, you, you've heard Rick talk about wall battles, you know, really being able to give your team some different uh, opportunities with the way you play and, and, and making it harder on opponents and whatnot. And, and I think what Rick came to the conclusion of was that we have a lot of offense and certainly Andre delivers a lot of offense and when when, when Andre had his minutes diminished it was going to impact his offense but the Canucks were having lots of success doing the things that Rick Talk had thought were important so that makes Andre expendable and when you're making a trade like the uh, Calgary Flames did and giving up Lindholm you're going to take back salary mm -hmm. so there's commensurate salary coming back the other way and you're going to need some players that can contribute offensively and uh, Andre clearly showed he was capable of that he's showing that again and and the other thing that I think that I, I really I really enjoy this about Andre. He, he's got this great joy of playing yep. the game. And the Vancouver Canucks fans saw that. The Calgary Flames fans are, are seeing that. But when you look at what Vancouver was doing and, and, and understanding what they were trying to do to, to make their team more complete, to make their team harder to play against all the way through the lineup, uh, sometimes players... Uh, you know, fall. I, I don't want to say fall by the wayside. That's not a fair thing. You, you're just looking for something a little bit different. And, and I think that that's what happened in Kuzmenko's case. Have Vancouver fans come close to seeing the best of Elias Lindholm? Not even. I, I would say outside of maybe the first three or four games, Donnie, you've seen the best. You, you know, Elias has had a, a, a real challenge. And obviously, you know, he was out of the lineup with with an injury. How long he was playing hurt and how much it was impacting him comes into play. But he, he's a much better player than he's shown uh, the Vancouver Canucks fans. And certainly, you know, you, you watch him and, and you understand what he's capable of doing. Listen, you, you know, the new season is going to begin once uh, game one of the playoffs starts. And I think what uh, Rick Tockett and everybody's hoping for is that uh, Lindholm is healthy or as close to he as healthy as he can be and can really give them what they need. Because a good Elias Lindholm, and, and he can be a really good player, and a really impactful player, that only makes the uh, Vancouver Canucks that much better team. Boy, oh boy, that game in Detroit last night. How fun was that, no. uh, uh, Craig? But this is it. This is the parody they wanted. They got it. They, these games down the stretch. Look at the Eastern Conference. This is what the league wanted, and they got it. But last night was a fabulous night to watch hockey. It, it really was. And, and and you think about, you know, Washington beating Boston at home. You know, Detroit falling behind 4-1 and uh, and then the comeback and then winning it in overtime. I mean, I mean, you, I mean, the arena was buzzing at Little Caesars Arena there. The Pittsburgh Penguins finding a way to win. The Islanders clinching a playoff spot. And, and you know what's fascinating too, Rick? I mean, I, I mean, we got Tuesday night that's going to deliver a lot of that. Yep, you know, yep. the Flyers can only, kind of, they have to win to stay alive. What happens if they're down late in a game? Obviously, they're going to pull the goalie we are not going to know 
until Thursday night, probably about, uh, I'm going to guess, somewhere in 45 Pacific time, who the Vancouver Canucks are going to play in the first round of the playoffs. Yeah. It, it, and, and so you think about running it right down to, to the last day of the, of, of the regular season, to the last games, LA and, and Vegas are playing at 7 o'clock Pacific time on the last day of the season, and, and, and we're not going to know who's playing who until that, those games are completed. It, 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 it has been great, and, and parity has been phenomenal, and the excitement if the excitement from monday night is any indication of what the playoffs are going to offer and i think they will offer that excitement boy are we in for a great ride hey craig the nhl central scouting uh, final rankings this morning they've got uh, who else uh, macklin celebrini uh, top <laughs> ranked north american skater just won the hobie baker i mean uh, you know this kid you know, the season he had at Boston University, uh, I, he's on the Canadian radar for the World Hockey Championships. Uh, but in your eyes, uh, is, is he a slam dunk uh, first, over, first overall pick this summer? Yeah, no, there's no question. He's the best player in this draft. And uh, I mean, there there is no there, there's no other consideration uh, for the first overall pick. And and, and he is. He, he is that first overall pick that can be a pillar for your franchise. I, I call him a, a franchise foundational player like a Jonathan Taves. And and maybe I'm underestimating, uh, you know, the offensive upside of, of Macklin Celebrini, but anybody would sign up to have a Jonathan Taves player on their team. And certainly Macklin Celebrini is complete. He's thorough in everything he does. He met the challenges of NCAA hockey at the age of 17 years of age. And he's got a brilliant and bright career in front of him. Second year in a row, a player from the lower mainland of BC, Vancouver, yeah. is going to get drafted first overall. I, I, I think it speaks volumes. You know, Gavin McKenna, who's who's from up north, who who, who plays in Medicine Hat. I mean, he's going to be. I mean, Connor Bedard's cousin. I mean, he's going to be another first overall pick in twenty twenty six. Because if there's a better player than Gavin McKenna, just tell me where they're where he is, and I, and that's where Macklin Celebrini finds himself. Think about it. Last year's a six year old best player in the USHL, mm. no question. Now he goes to he goes to the World Junior Tournament as a seven year old best player for Canada goes to the NCAA best player of the NCAA it won't be long before we're talking about him as being one of the best players in the National Hockey League and, and we know his uh, father well uh, Rick from the Golden State yeah, Warriors yeah, yeah. Uh, who was a pro soccer player around these parts he's uh, from here as well obviously uh, hey Craig. W w uh, if the Canucks indeed play uh, Nashville, Nashville's finished. They, they're, they've completed their 82 games, so they're going to have a, a week between games if indeed the series with them and the Canucks, if that happens, starts uh, next Tuesday. The Canucks, not as many days in between. What would you ra rather have, a, a few days rest or a week off? Well, I, I think the Canucks are going to get a good three days off after they play Thursday night. And, you know, that's in Winnipeg, and they're not going to open up. And, and, and in fact, my understanding is they may not open up until Tuesday. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yep. you know, when you, when you, so, 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 so I think at this point in the season, you know, just getting refreshed, getting relaxed, you know, getting ready for the, for the playoff grind, I think four days is more than enough. I think that the Vancouver Canucks can, can take advantage of that rest and use it uh, very, very well. Well, in, in terms of their preparations, you know, the Nashville Predators play fast, they play quick, they play hard. And certainly, as, as we were just talking about Kazmanko and what Rick talked and mm -hmm. the coaching staff were looking to get their team to be, I think they're up for the challenge. I thought last Saturday night in Edmonton, save for the first 10 minutes of the game yep. where Casey DeSmith was outstanding, I thought the Canucks played an outstanding game for 50 minutes. I thought the, the Edmonton Oilers, I thought they really looked like a real solid try to find a gap in our play. And, and, and if they play like that, they're going to be difficult to beat come playoff time. And, and quickly, Craig, before we let you go, uh, let's go back to the mid-90s here. Did you think the NHL would work in Phoenix? Yeah, I did. Uh, and the, I mean, I don't think there's any – I didn't have any reason to think that it wouldn't. And, and I think that – you know, with with the with, with the progress of, of amateur hockey, minor hockey yeah. in, in Arizona, it's been really impressive. I think they have a, a, a good, solid fan base, but but the economics and and, and everything that, that that's necessary to be a participant in National Hockey League don't work with the five thousand seat arena. And and we can understand and try to figure out okay who who takes the responsibility for that and, and where's it at. 
I think this was a really good, prudent move by the NHL. I, I think it, it, it screams win for so many different people, in the, and including the owner who's going to make a, 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 a significant return on his, on a, on his buy, buying of the Arizona Coyotes. Opportunity to come back as an expansion franchise. Atlanta's had two cracks at expansion, and I think Arizona is a coveted market. But you know, regardless of where you are, if you don't have good ownership and you don't have good local stability in, in, in your business, uh, stakeholders and your supporters, you're going to have struggles. And, and a 5,000 seat arena simply doesn't work in today's NHL. And that to me is, is why this has become a necessary move. And, you know, we'll see what plays out in the next three to five years with the Arizona Cowboys. Yep. But I, I have no doubt in my mind it can work there. And I have no doubt that the NHL would like to be there. Craig, thanks for this. We'll talk to you next week before the playoffs. Thank you. Have a great day. Yeah, it'll yeah, be fun. Or before, yes. the, before the Canucks uh, playoff series. Thanks, Craig. <laughs> Appreciate it.